I think I'm the only non-Episcopalian here, so I guess I can... <laughs> Raise your hand again if you're non-Episcopalian. All right, who's in charge of St. Luke's development? Right here. Marion, you told me to do that, right? Find out who isn't one of ours. <laughs> Terrific. What a turn off. This is, this is fantastic. It's quite overwhelming, I have to say. It's awesome. And so what we're going to do today is to have a little interview, learn a little bit about Mitchell Anderson, learn a little bit about uh, recipe, food and thought. Uh, one thing you will not hear from me, and I just right up front, because my, my wife, Cindy, was laughing hilariously when she heard that I was going to interview you about recipes. Because at no point in our marriage has she ever seen me pick anything up and actually read it and well, do anything with now it. Now that you have the book, you actually can. I can. Yeah. But I'm so thrilled that there's... Trying, anyway. That's right. There's a food and a thought, so the thought will be spending... <laughs> yeah. so, you will have a thought. Okay. So, uh, first of all, I mean, I'm going to sit here in a second, but we just had chili. Why don't you explain what that chili was. I mean, that's your good conscience. Right, so, um, uh, hi everybody, first of all, and I, I'm overwhelmed by all of you um, coming to share this evening with me in St. Luke's Church, where I spent so much of my childhood and young adult life, and I know that um, my parents would be, uh, would be just beaming if they were, would be able to be here. Um, so thank you for coming. So. The chili, which we call mid chili, um, it, it's one of the recipes in the book. Um, the, at the restaurant, Metro Fresh, um, my menu changes every day. We do basically, soup, we're known for soups and salads, but within that, the only thing that we've made every day for 10 years is mid chili. Um, so it's a turkey chili, it has um, lots of uh, coriander and, um, and, cumin and chili powder and some uh, Dijon mustard and so it's a little zippy, it has some um, dill and uh, cilantro in it and um, people really do come from a long way to get um, mint chili and you guys just got to have some. Yeah. And now that you're going to get a book, you can actually make it at home. By the way, it's just an administrative piece, Mitch will sign all books uh, at the end of the event because I know he sort of uh, was caught up here and many people bought books, but I assume you'll be more than happy to autograph them. I, I will, and I'll just, I'll just stay right here and please come up and, and say hello and I'd be happy to autograph your book. And I'll try to spell your name right. So, talk to me about Scott Kinberg. Oh my God, Scott Kinberg! <laughs> So this is, this is, this is the, the, the value of growing up in Jamestown, or a town like Jamestown, is, so I wrote this book, right, and I self-published it. It's quite an undertaking, both financially and time-consuming. Um, I put out a lot to, to do the book. Um, so it's up to me to sell it, right? So uh, I was thinking of various places that I might be able to do uh, a signing. So I called uh, Scylla Menzies, who's like one of my sisters, and I said, Scylla, what do you think if I come up to Jamestown to, to do a signing? And she said, oh my god, that'd be great. I would, I would love to help you with that. And then I thought, who do I know who can get me some publicity? <laughs> and of course, Scott and I uh, were in class of 79 at Jamestown High School, and I um, emailed Scott and I said, Hey Scott, um, I'm thinking of I have this book coming out, and uh, would you be able to convince the Post Journal to put a little story in about me? And of course, that was not a huge problem, but that's how Scott got involved, and and then Scylla and Scott um, very graciously um, offered to host this evening. So I I want to make sure that I thank both of them for getting this together. Well, then And what's remarkable, and you need to know that, is you got onto a part of the Post Journal which was not the sports page. That's something. That's rarefied air for Scott. That's right. Yeah, I, I got him to practice, you know, in a different section, the A section. Yeah, yeah. And he's he's pleased to be that. So, uh, what do you got against Ludafisk? 
<laughs> no, really. I mean, for those that have read the book, and I have, uh, he, he really talks about much about his life here, growing up, his Swedish traditions, his background. It's phenomenal. I highly recommend it. Then he talks about what I, of course, experienced, all about the Swedish you know, Christmas standard traditional things, and I'll let you describe it. Tell me um, how big your portion of Ludafis is every year. <laughs> very modest, very M modest. Modest is, a, is a, like in a half a slice. Like yeah, 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 it's an yeah, understatement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the stories in the the, the book is all about um, just things that come to my mind over the last ten years. Um, since my menu changes every day, I knew that I wanted to get my menu into the inboxes of people that potentially could be customers. Um, so literally on day one, um, October 5th, 2005, I um, wrote a little story. I said, you know, we are Metrofresh and this is how we opened and here's my menu. I sent it out to 250 people that I had on my email list. So every day after that, I started writing a little story. And it could, at first it was mostly about the restaurant and I called it sort of adventures of restaurant world because, you know, frankly, when you open a restaurant, um, it's all consuming. I was working, I would get there at 5 o'clock in the morning, I would work until about 2.30 in the afternoon, go home, take a nap, and then I would come back at 4 to cook dinner, and I'd stay till 10. And this went on for about a year and a half until I hired somebody else. It was a great time, but it was the adventures of restaurant world. So my entire life was consumed by it. But all along, every day before I uh, send out the menu, I just start thinking about things. And the cool thing about curating these hundreds and thousands of blogs that I've written over the years, and you know, mind you, this is before Facebook and before uh, all the social media and sort of the oversharing that we do <laughs> all yeah. the time now. Um, is that it really did give people a personal buy-in to what to who I was and a reason to support Metrofresh, not because only because we had great food, but because they knew they knew me. They got to know personal parts of me. Um, and I believe that including over the years these stories about my childhood and about the rich life that my parents were able to give me you know, here at St. Luke's and Jamestown at JHS at Washington Junior High School at Euclid at CC Ring, and, and it it really brings people along on on the journey of life, and putting it all together in in the cookbook, I had a woman who uh, was helping me um, do some editing, and at first her thought was only include the funny stories, only include the positive ones, only include the ones that are uh, uplifting. Well, you know what? Unfortunately, life is life. So what I looked at it is, I've got this job to do. I get up every morning, I make food, I sell it, I have 24 employees that count on me to be there and make this happen, right? Every single day. But in the background, life is going on. You know, you wake up in the morning and you have a great memory about uh, Halloween at 121 Arlington and the, and the Great Pumpkin, or the, it's, it's cold outside. So I, I remember my mom at literally at two o'clock in the morning on a you know, minus four degrees day, getting outside and, and making a, a, an amazing ice rink for us at Fort Ridgely Terrace. Um, I remember uh, Memorial Day at the Wellmans and how important that was to us to have those traditions. Um, but also, you know, my parents are getting older. They've had some health issues. Um, my brother passed away. And all of those things that happen while you're doing your life, you know, it's just part of life. It's the journey. So I really did choose to include the good, the bad, and the ugly, the sacred and the profane, the comic and the tragic. And I think that that's, for me, what makes it sort of a rich and fuller experience. And the tragic was Ludafisk. <laughs> and absolutely the tragic was Ludafisk. Yeah. So just want to bring this story all the way around here. Right. So, so anyway, so one, so one of these is about um, going to Grandma's house in Bellevue. And, you know, every year we had to have a little slice of Ludafisk and a little thing of corn and some sill and some bundas. A bundas I like. 
Uh, and, and, um, and I, I didn't mind the broom burner and the um, frock of sopa, I liked. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, it's all about, uh, oh, the wrist groin screw it. Rice pudding. Rice pudding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah. I, you have a good memory. I just yeah, we, um, we used to take the, um, the core. Oh, I didn't like the core. My dad loves the core. Um, but we used to take the loot fist and put it in our napkins and excuse ourselves and, and, and empty it in the toilet. <laughs> no turtles died because of that, did they? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so you mentioned your family, uh, and, and everybody's asked, you know, Greg, be sure you ask about your family, uh, your mom, dad, and others. Could you just give them kind of a brief update as to, to where they are? And sure. Um, uh, mom and dad are in Florida. Uh, dad will be 85 um, a week from Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. And uh, Richie and I are going to go down and, and be there for um, Thanksgiving. Um, we had a lovely Thanksgiving last year, um, and George and Scylla came down and joined us, which was so great for us, and I hope great for you. Um, but mom and dad, you know, they've, they've had a rough time. Um, aging for them has been uh, difficult. Um, and more, more difficult because they were the enthusiastic people. They were the, they were the people that brought everybody together. And honestly, I believe that their example in terms of what food does and what experience and events are, they're so important in life. And their energy and the, the people that, that they brought around them all their lives, all, all of our lives, was so important to, to who we are as, as adults, right? Um, so watching them go through their, um, their aging process has been, has been tragic, really. Um, Mom is, they're, they're, they're both hanging in there, you know, and it could go on for another, for a long time, and, and we hope it does in some ways, and if it doesn't, then that's part of life, you know. But it's, it's on, honestly, um, you know, our generation, the pe people who are between their 50s and early 60s, you know, this is what we're, we're dealing with. And, you know, it's so awesome to see my parents' best friends here, you know, and that's, that makes me in incredibly happy, and as I say, my, my parents would be thrilled. How about your siblings? Um, they're good. Um, uh, we were just all together um, at my nephew Andreas's wedding. He was married um, in the beginning of September along the Hudson River. We were, all went to Catskill, and we rented this great big house, and all the grandkids, and you know, my, my nieces and nephews, most of them now are are young adults and they're super fun and really great and I've got one grandniece and another one on the way another grandchild grandniece or nephew on the way. I, there's no there's no gender neutral term for that uh, my sister's about to have another grandchild um, Heidi lives in New York Chris and Barney live in uh, Virgins Vermont and um, Tracy lives in outside of Seattle, and Brooks is still in, in Buffalo. And he would have been here tonight if um, my uh, niece, Amelia, had not had her swimming um, uh, banquet tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Which was very important. Yes. Certainly more important than this. So you're an actor. Your, your career has been vast. And would you be normally panicked to have the post-journal critic in the front row? <laughs> Would, that, would you look out uh, from the stage of which we are? Robert Pyler is here. I'm not looking that way. <laughs> no way. I'm, ner I'm nervous. Now, he was telling me a story that he recalls at St. Saint, Saint Luke's here of the time when, uh, during the Doogie Hauser days, um, that you brought in uh, Neil Patrick Harris. Is that, is that correct, or did he make that up? He totally made that up. <laughs> Boy, was I impressed, Bob. I quoted you. <laughs> you must remember something I don't. No, I did not bring in Neil Patrick Harris. No. Did everybody remember that for help Bob out? Just, just everybody dream that. Anybody here? No. Neil, Neil never came here. But that was a, that was a nice memory. I did see Neil um, a year ago. I went to New York and saw Hedwig. 
Um, and it was honestly one of the most amazing performances that I'd ever seen. And to know somebody, you know, I knew him very well when he was 16. And of course now I'm 54 and he's 45 probably. Um, and we have not been in touch. We're not like, you know, Facebook buddies or anything. But um, he was very gracious and saw us backstage and he couldn't have been nicer. His parents happened to be there because it was his birthday. And of course I knew them. And you know, to see somebody grow and be such a, a great performer, talented guy, but more importantly, to be such a, a, a great human being, live in his live in his world, in his honesty, and and just be he's he's great. So I, I you know I sat there in the first row of the balcony, just weeping because I was so proud of him. I had no business being proud of him. I mean, I you know knew him thirty years ago, but he's he's just a great person, and I'm, and I was I, I was very proud to have known him. A couple of your teachers are back there, the Kurtzels, and they were telling me earlier that they there they are, <laughs> and, and, and they, we're going to make some Orville Redenbacher's gourmet popping corn. <laughs> Anybody else have Mr. Kurtzels? Yeah. yeah so you remember that. And whenever, uh, whenever there was a, a beep out on Second Street, Mr. Kurtzall would wave. And then we're going to go to Mitchell Anderson's house and have some Orville Redenbacher. <laughs> well, they videotaped on, on the old VHSs, all of yours, handed it out to somebody else, and they can't find it, so they're really distraught. Could you just give them one line of a Doogie Howser, just a, a moment, <laughs> something, with, as Jack McGuire, just... Something. Yeah. Can, can you think of something? Mostly that, when I said on Doogie Hauser, <laughs> Hauser was, uh, the next patient on the chart is Ruth Faber. <laughs> Blood type A. <laughs> or intubate, stat. Perfect. Yeah, and that's pretty much all I did. <laughs> Isn't that what you wanted? You wanted that action, right? Yeah, okay. Talk about, uh, I mean, that was a significant part. How, how did one get from um, St. Luke's Church stage uh, to find yourself Juilliard and find yourself off Broadway and was there it was an aha moment? Uh, yeah, the C minus in chemistry. That I had. <laughs> <laughs> when I was at Williams, I, I thought I was going to be a doctor for so many many years of growing up, and and you know I had Mr. Hall at, at AP Chem, and he was super hard, and I got A's, you know. So I thought, oh yeah, I'm good at this, right? So I get to Williams, and I take advance freshman chemistry, biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> I remember literally going to take tests and throwing up on the way because I was so nervous. I, I mean, I never got any, I mean, maybe I got a couple Bs in high school, but I don't remember very many of them, right? So I, my freshman year, I was in danger of failing the first semester of advanced freshman chem. I didn't fail. The second semester, I got a B minus, which was a big improvement, right? So then I, I went on to organic chemistry, but my, we had it was kind of a um, one of those professors who'd been at Williams for 172 years, and he was scary, but he was really he was very fair, he was very nice, and but he was an institution at Williams, and he would come over when I was like creating my my. Um, things in lab, you, you had to buy, build these big glass structures. It was like a rector set with, you know, beakers and tubes and stuff. And you're trying to get a yield of some, um, you know, amino acid. And I would have, so, I, I couldn't even weigh the yield. He, um, so he would come over and put his, you know, arms together like this and he'd just go. <laughs> and you know, I'd sweat. And so, after a couple um, Paris minuses in the, that class, I was like, you know, maybe I should not be um, be an, uh, a doctor. And I had always taken, you know, obviously a lot of you remember the musicals that I did here in, in Jamestown, and I was certainly a big part of acapella and Men of Tomorrow and um, and the Madrigals, and I sang here in the church and. Um, it was a huge part of my life. So uh, during college, I always took one theater class. And halfway through college, I went to my parents and said, you know what, I'm not good at this chemistry thing. I can't, I, I'm just not good at it, but I really think that I want to be an actor. And bless my parents' heart, you know, my dad said, I don't care what you do, but do it well. So they knew 100% 
And because of their support and their encouragement, I never had a second second thought. So, yeah, I went to Juilliard. I auditioned. I got in, and halfway through my freshman, my first year at Juilliard, I got a job. And and some of you actually probably came to um, Washington, D.C. to see on Shiloh Hill. Oh, the Kurtz did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they they brought they, the popcorn. They're groupies. <laughs> And George and Ginny did, yeah. Um, so that was my first my first job, and it was obviously uh, a, a bit of right place at the right time kind of thing. But you know, I'm in my early twenties, and I had all this confidence, and I believed in myself, and I had a great background, and I thought I can do this. So went out to Los Angeles and started auditioning, and worked my way up, and and it. It worked, and it was exciting, and I loved it. Does it strike you? I mean, now you can all go on right now if you get bored of this interview, and on your iPhone, type in Mitchell Anderson, and you'll have a Wikipedia uh, section on Mitchell Anderson, actor, Jamestown, New York, and you'll know how when he was born and his age and everything else. Does that strike you? I mean, here you are sitting in Jamestown. Next thing you know, you've got a, a little a whole, you've got a web page and learn all about you. Well, I'll tell you what, um, it, it was my 20 year acting career was really the greatest um, start to a restaurant. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I really loved the theater and I was good at it. Um, I, I went into it because I, I love the communication, I love the art form. Um, I think it's an amazing experience. Like, like tonight, you sit down and you, even though we're doing the talking and you're doing the laughing. Um, we hope. We hope, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a conversation that we're having. Um, and I think that's a beautiful thing. That the awesome thing about theater is that it's over like that. And you have a memory. So that's what I learned in college. And honestly, Ms. Dorman, or Grace, we, we're allowed to call her Grace now. <laughs> she said that after, after high school, and I was like, I don't think that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, we st we studied Macbeth in in AP English in um, as a junior. We st we I was sure that it was important. You know, it, it didn't even occur to me that this was a frivolous thing. Um, so going into the theater and and having that background was amazing. Um, <laughs> I was encouraged very early to go out to Los Angeles and, and be in the television and film world. I was lucky enough to start working right away. Um, I made a fairly good living for a long, long time. But the interesting thing is that when you first start out, anything is exciting. So I would get, you know, my very first job on television was Hill Street Blues. I think I worked three days. It was between Christmas and New Year's. And it was super exciting. I was on a television set for the first time in my life, and I, I believe I had four lines. I mean, I, it was nothing, right? Um, and then the next few jobs were about the same in size. And then, you know, I got bigger jobs and bigger jobs and um, some TV movies, and then finally Doogie Howser and... Jaws. You got and I got eaten by a shark in Jaws. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I was in space camp, people. I was in space camp. <laughs> Um, but, so that's great when you're first starting out. So I'm into my early 30s and, you know, things are going okay. But as they start to know you better, you get less and less auditions, fewer and fewer auditions. Um, which is frustrating because you think you should get more and more auditions. But they know you. You know, you're more of a known commodity. So I started to feel like, you know, I would get up in the morning and not have anything to do. And I was, you know, like my dad said best time of the day is between five and nine in the morning, and after that, you might as well go back to bed. So I would do that, right? And I, and I wasn't working. And none, none of my friends are awake. So I'd go to the gym, and I'd work out, and then I'd come home, and if finally I got a computer, and I would answer emails or do whatever I had to do, and I'd read the paper, I'd eat a healthy breakfast, and then I had nothing to do. And after Dave and Scylla moved out of Los Angeles, I didn't have a tennis partner. So I always joke that you could tell if I wasn't working if my tennis game was good. Um, but as as you get into your early and your mid thirties, 
if you have the kind of background that I have and you have the sort of drive and you want, and you want to make something important with your life, it starts to become less and less thrilling to get an episode of, you know, CSI Miami. Um, even though that pays the bills and that's awesome and it's great to be on television, but you really need those bigger and bigger parts or those more important things. You know, I did, I did a couple awesome TV movies, but what I was really enjoying at that, at that time was going to, you know, Actors Theater of Louisville or doing a play in Costa Mesa or going off Broadway for six months doing Visiting Mr. Green where Uncle George brought the poster for Visiting yeah. Mr. Green. Um, and those, those were what was, they, they were feeding me artistically. Yes. Syracuse. And then I did um, I did uh, a picture play in Syracuse. Yeah. So those were like they were feeding me artistically, but unfortunately they don't pay. You know, you, you I was getting when I was doing Visiting Mr. Green, which was a big job. I was you know the only two people in the play. I was making twelve hundred bucks a week minus taxes and commission. You know, so you can't really make a living in your late thirties and forties doing what I was loving. So I started doing a lot more political work. I started doing a lot of volunteering for um, uh, AIDS and HIV um, programs in Los Angeles. And that was filling me. That was making me more of a solid person, I felt. And I realized when I was turning 40 that I did not want to be 50 and still auditioning. So that's how I transitioned out of show business. I was like, this is, this is my time. So I was in New York um, at, uh, on September 11th, um, 2001. And my partner Richie was in Atlanta. And that was the day that certainly all, all lives changed. Um, but that was, that was really what I just turned 40 and I really had that impetus to say, life's too short, what do I love? I love home, I love communication, I love people, and I looked around for something else to do. And how fortunate I was to have parents who could back me, both emotionally, spiritually, and frankly, financially. Um, I had a partner that was behind me 100%. I had friends who were able to see through that transition. And I had an education from high school, you know, junior high, high school, uh, college that gave me the confidence to know that I could figure out things I didn't know and know to, who to talk to to find out those things. So I, I opened MetroFresh um, with the help of so many people, but mostly I was smart enough to, to know that I had to go back and learn. So I got this great mentor. I worked with her for two and a half years. And when I was ready, she literally pushed me out the door and said, go open your own place. Jennifer Levison. Yes. Super Jenny. Yeah. Uh, well, talk a little bit about her. I mean, she's, she's, she's okay. got, got so, a story under herself. Yeah, she's, she is an Atlanta na native. Um, her stepfather was a television writer, so she lived part-time um, in Los Angeles. And she trained as an actress. She went to Carnegie Mellon. Um, but she, too, she never really wanted to be in show business. She just loved the theater. Um, so she knew that she had to have another job. So she, she was a really good cook, and she brought these great people together, and she used to do Sunday brunches at some other restaurant. She would just come in and do it. Um, so she has this Atlanta institution called Super Jenny, and she's very known for homemade soups. Um, and we got along, Richie knows her, and had known her for years, and she, he introduced us, and we got along great. And so I, she said, yeah, you can come work for me, and, and I told her I'd work for free. And so I'd show up in the morning at 5.30, and she called me at 5.30 at night, and she said, are you really gonna come tomorrow? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'm gonna be there. So I'd go in at five the next morning, at 5.30 the next morning, and she was a great teacher. Fortunately, I already had a lot of skills. Like I knew how to hold a knife. I knew how to I knew how to chop an onion. You know, so she didn't have to like it wasn't remedial, but she was <laughs> it, you know, exactly. So um, I was able to take direction from her. So she would say, "I need you to make a Moroccan lentil soup," 
Well, and tomorrow you're going to make a Moroccan lentil soup. So I would run to the internet and I go, oh, what does that mean? You know, what kind of spices does that mean? So I'd, I'd, I'd go and do a little research and I'd come in and I would put that together and I, you know, uh, it, there's a big difference between making soup, four quarts of soup, which is in the four to six quarts, which is in the book, and 40 quarts, which is in this huge pot. Um, and we would do six soups a day. So, um, she taught me this great sort of improvisational approach to food. Um, when I was making a salad, she would walk by and say, need something red. And I, and I would have to say, well, what does that mean? Is that uh, roasted red pepper? Is that uh, dried cranberries? Is that, you know? So it, it was all about how it looks, how it, how it the, the depth of the salad. Um, and that, I just took to it. And the greatest thing is that we laughed the whole time. She and I had the, the, the exact same sense of humor, and to this day, we're best friends. The greatest story in the world is that the day I opened MetroFresh, she closed her shop and put a sign on the door and said, I'm going to MetroFresh, please join me. Oh, that's great. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Like, how, how amazing to be it, at my age to have met somebody that, that would give that much of herself. And I'm not going to lie to you, MetroFresh is a direct descendant of Super Jenny. It's not the same. It's a, uh, we have breakfast and dinner. She's just a lunch place. Um, but she, she allowed that knowledge to come into me and is able to be proud of the fact that now I'm 10 years old and she now comes to me for advice, which is just awesome. So what's it like in the sense that you're a celebrity, you're now behind the, you're in the kitchen. I mean, you're working it as opposed to a normal celebrity type restaurant where the guy's out front, or woman, and shaking hands and saying, come join me type of thing. Did, did, did that play? I mean, that's what, kind of a wonderful transition. Did, did that play in your yeah, presentation? Yeah, you know, as I say, the, the greatest thing that I could have done for my restaurant is had a 20 year acting career um, because the story is interesting. So as you say, um, a lot of people who were in my position, not that I was hugely famous, but I was sort of famous, um, would open a restaurant and they would hire a chef and they would be the guy who goes out and greets people and says hi and you know, and yeah, so that's okay. You know, that's, that's an okay story. But the good story is to see me in the kitchen day after day after day after day. And as I told you, I worked 80 hours, 90 hours a week. Every day, people would come in and see me standing behind that prep counter because I, I arranged it so you could see right into the kitchen so they could, they could see me. And, you know, it gave people, it gave the Atlanta Journal-Constitution something to write about. It gave Atlanta Magazine something to write about. Um, so honestly, it was being a celebrity as much as I am or was, um, really did help, but I think that, that for me, I like the work. Like, I love creating those salads. I love creating those soups, and, it, and it's, a, it's a great way to work because it, it's never boring. It's always exciting. The energy in the kitchen is great, and it flows out into the restaurant. I mean, you have a work ethic, skill sets. How much is that, do you find, attributed to your grandmothers? You write about them a lot. Oh, you know, this is, when I started thinking about writing the book, and, and many of you know both of my grandmothers, um, I, I was, I, I thought about those Sunday dinners that we would have at Bellevue, and how important they were in, in our lives. Or when we went to Rochester and visited Nana and Grampy, and the beautiful gourmet dinners that she, she put out. It was so important. And the amazing dinners that my mom would do just on a daily basis. Um, that was important to me and I really believe that, that not only was that my culinary inspiration, but it was an inspiration for life. So grandma, who um, Cecil, who many of you know, I always thought was like the Betty Crocker. Um, because she was this incredible Americana cook. We would have these awesome dinners on Sunday, you know, roast beef and Yorkshire pudding and, 
and oven roasted potatoes and whatever fresh vegetable was in season. And we'd have baked Alaska or floating islands or um, she, snow pudding, which was this amazing um, uh, lemon, like a uh, lemon frothy pudding. Um, and we'd eat and have great conversation and laugh. And, and at the end of the meal, she'd always say, oh, it was just catch as catch can. <laughs> and like, Nana, are you kidding me? So then Nana was, the, was sort of the opposite. Um, and, and I call her in the book um, like the Julia Child because she was a gourmand. She loved reading Gourmet Magazine and she would create, she would do Chateaubriand and she would do you know, incredible soups, and Grampy had this amazing garden, and, um, you know, beets would come out of the, uh, out of the garden, get shaken off and hosed off, and then into the pot, and we'd eat them with just a little butter and salt, and, um, but her, you know, her table was beautiful, it was all about the drama, and the funny thing about Nana is that she always said, oh, that could have used some more salt, and that was overcooked, and, and it never was. It was always perfect. Um, but it, so those two women were, uh, you know, and certainly my mom, too, and I, and I, I feel a little bit like I, I should have written about the three women, because mom put food on the table for six kids every single night, and that's an accomplishment. You know, that's an amazing accomplishment. And given the fact that she was off at the school board meeting or at the WCA or crash or, you know, doing all of these community things, you know, she was an amazing influence as well. Well, again, back to, back to your work ethic and uh, in the crowd, here's George Griffin. George Griffin, of course, uh, you, you write about certain folks that were part of your world, part of the camp, Mayville. And you even talked a little bit about Pathfinders. If George were to come up here today, and I'm not asking him to, but if he were to ask you some question, he he likes to talk a microphone. Yeah. So, <laughs> but if he were, if he, what would be the question you'd most not want to hear George ask you about? <laughs> Think back to the Camp Mayville days. Think back with the Cadwells, the Griffins, and all those. I kids. was not in that crowd. <laughs> those kids were bad. <laughs> It was all Silla's fault. No, it was silly. no, it wasn't it was even Silla's fault. It was the older kids. It was those. It was those those Rendell kids. And you know, none of the Rendells are here, so they can't defend themselves. I do have. I don't know if I can tell this story in church. Oh, wait, no, go ahead, because I'll edit it out. Yeah. And there aren't that many Episcopalians. We found that out. So no telling who they are. Okay. So you have. We're all adults here, right? We can talk about this. And you have to know that it was in the middle of the 70s, right? So, I, George, you probably remember this. Um, so we, we had been there for 12 hours, and um, so that now it's the next morning. And, you know, frankly, there was quite a lot of partying going on from upstairs and downstairs. So, so you know, nobody's clean in this. Um, so George walks by and picks up a thing of rolling papers, and, and he says, I don't know what these are for, but I wish I was invited. <laughs> That's so George Griffin, right? Uh, you know, honestly, um, Camp Mayville and, and so many of the other things that we did, uh, the Sportsman's Club and, and the Clam Bank and the, so many things that grounded us in this love and you know, the, the love of family that we have so, so much around us. And, and I have to say that, you know, mom and dad's house is for sale on the lake. Anybody want to buy it? Um, uh, it's, it's hard to do for us, you know, because sure. the Andersons have been here since my great-grandfather came in the 1800s, 1890s. So... The fact that after mom and dad's house sells, not that we don't have certainly connection here, because we do and we always will, but there won't be, you know, Anderson property here. It'll be, it's kind of strange. As you look out in the crowd, is there anybody else you want to tell a story about? <laughs> <laughs> that one, just one story. Just one, if you have one, look at Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Any stories we should tell? Are you talking to me? 
Yeah. No, we can't. We can't no. Tony's an elected official. We can't tell him. Most of these. <laughs> well, you know, you, you wrote a book. I did. I wrote a book. Wrote a book called Food and Thought. And uh, as we draw, getting close to closure here, um, one, and I will open this up for question and answer. But do you, is there a passage or two you'd like to share? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, Don't read a recipe. Uh, I will. I will. <laughs> I will read a recipe. You'll lose me. <laughs> Um, I, I, there's um, three passages that I'm going to read. Um, uh, one uh, just ha has a little bit to do with St. Luke's, but you can see from it the kind of restaurant we are. We have a really great neighborhood restaurant. We have people that eat at the restaurant twice a day, five days a week. Because we're that kind of place where if you live by yourself, you come to us and we know you. You know, we're your family, you know, and, and I make a different thing every day. So you're never going to have the same thing two days in a row. Um, one thing that we do, I, I went and talked to Acapella today and it was awesome and such a great experience. But we're right across the street from Grady High School. And I don't know why this has anything to do with what I'm going to read. But um, just to show you that um, uh, we support all the, a lot of organizations at Grady High School in Atlanta. And one of them is the chorus. So... Um, three years in a row, we've had a cabaret to raise money, raise funds for the chorus. And it is the cutest thing in the world. So these kids come and they perform and they get on this little stage. And we don't have a very big restaurant, but it's awesome. And through auction and money that we donate, um, this year we raised almost $6,000 in one night. So, um, so that, that's to say that Sometimes, like, we've had a clam bake at the, uh, two years in a row, we had a clam bake at the restaurant. Um, things that I just remember, we've had uh, beef on wick, you know, things that we bring from our, um, from our childhood or experience. So this is from Tuesday, February 24th, 2009. So today is Fat Tuesday. Much revelry and partying will go down tonight in many parts of the world, especially New Orleans. So we are going to honor the day with our own Fat Tuesday celebration. First of all, Papa, me, they call me Papa, Papa at the restaurant, um, is cooking up some shrimp creole with crispy fried okra. It will be my own version of the traditional dish, and we're having our first Shrove Tuesday pancake supper. Pancake sausage patties and fruit for just $8. That's my little plug. And uh, children under 12 eat pancakes for free. Why pancakes? Well, you know we like to bring in food traditions from home. Mine happens to be Jamestown, New York. We always had a Shrove Tuesday pancake supper in the church basement right here. There were no crazy masks or costumes, and aside from the martinis, our parents... <laughs> There's a statute of limitations. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Aside from martinis that my parents drank before taking us to dinner, there wasn't much partying, but it was still fun. Uh, I never knew why pancakes until this morning when I did a little Googling. Shrove Tuesday marked the beginning of the 40-day Lenten fasting period when the faithful were forbidden by the church to consume meat, butter, eggs, or milk. However, if a family had a store of these foods... They all would um, go bad by the time the fast ended on Easter Sunday. What to do? Solution? Use up the milk, butter, and eggs no later than Shrove Tuesday. And so, with it, the addition of a little flour, the solution quickly presented itself in pancakes. And lots of them. So, that's a little Shrove Tuesday, and it has to do with the church. That's why I chose that one. Uh, uh, this is from uh, Father's Day... Uh, June 17th, 2007. Happy Father's Day. A few words of wisdom from my father, R. Quintus Anderson. Number one, the best part of the day is between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. After that, you might as well go back to bed. <laughs> Number two, the turtle only gets ahead by sticking its neck out. Okay. Number three, when you graduate from college, you are welcome to come visit any time. <laughs> but you are now responsible to make your own home and you are not welcome to live here <laughs> number four if you need to chew gum do it in your closet <laughs> number five 
Wake up every morning and ask what you can do for those around you. Number six, remember that decisions are hard, but also remember that the most important thing to do is to make a decision and then go for it. Number seven, if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. And I literally just had to tell this to one of my new employees. I said, my dad always said, if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. And you're now at 7.05 and you're late. And, number, and finally, have fun, give generously, be kind. I honestly try to live by most of these. My father is a kind, generous, smart, and gentle man. He was very successful in his life and taught us the most important thing you can do is share success with others. We would not have a Metrofresh if it were not for his support, guidance, and encouragement. When I began this journey into my own, uh, to owning my own business, I had come from the flaky world of the arts. My father had always supported my decision to act. He was always proud of my accomplishments on stage and screen. But when I changed direction and headed into the business world, suddenly we could speak the same language. I feel like this new journey has led me closer, closer to him, and for that I'm immensely grateful. Now if I could just get now if I could just learn how to play golf. <laughs> I love you, Dad. Okay, and, and um, I'm going to read this one because it does, it's so, um, everybody will remember um, the location of this. Um, at least if you've lived here for a long time. Uh, Thursday, December 8th, uh, 2011. I was thinking this morning about Chris Christmas traditions. Most notably, the Christmas cards my parents sent every year. They started having children in the 50s, and each year they sent a picture of the kids. From 1956 to 1961, there was one more kid in each picture. <laughs> one year, when Dad was feeling particularly flush, I guess, or perhaps when Mom pressured him into doing so, we had a real portrait done at Ina Siegfried Studios. Oh, boy. It was the height of, of um, 1968 fancy, all dark wood paneling, heavy drapery backdrops, and lots and lots of lights. I, the budding young actor, thought it was heaven. It took forever to shoot a family portrait with five kids. The youngest wasn't even born yet. I have no doubt there were tears involved. There, were always some, there was always some sort of drama with pigtails. <laughs> And I seem to remember a cigarette smoke haze in the, the studio that wafted under the hot lights Ina Siegfried had set up. It was still the 60s, and smoking was encouraged just about everywhere. <laughs> and I was fascinated by Ina Siegfried, whose very name conjured in my seven-year-old brain a sense of exotic mystery. She even had a German accent, for Pete's sake. Being the goody-goody of the family, I was all ear-to-ear -ear with smiles, wearing my gray flannel shorts, sitting on a stool with my legs crossed at the knees, princess-style, looking happy as a clam, without a hint of irony, just enjoying the spotlight. <laughs> My much more worldly siblings, even my youngest si sister, all seem to be in on some sort of inside joke. They seem to know, even then, the end result would be like a Fellini still. <laughs> Merry Christmas from the Andersons. In the last years that, there, in the years after that, there were many, many more cards, but none were as fancy as the year we went to Ina Siegfried Studios. <laughs> My parents have them all collected and framed in their new apartment in Florida, and it really is amazing to see how our family grew and changed. You can almost write the story of our lives just from looking at the images we collected at those moments each year growing up. Okay, so come and see us and warm up with some good soups. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Few more minutes. Uh, any, any questions of Mitchell? Anybody think it's just burning? If not, oh yeah, let's go ahead. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, that's Cynthia Gibb. Watch your, uh, read the question. Oh, so the, the question was, do I have any um, uh, communication with the woman who played uh, Karen in the Karen Carpenter story? Um, Cynthia and I became very good friends. Um, she no longer lives in Los Angeles. She lives, uh, I believe, in Connecticut or Maine, someplace back east. She grew up in Connecticut. And she still works occasionally in, in show business, but she, um, she and I had the same voice teacher for many, many years. And she took pedagogy and learned how to be a voice teacher, so that's what she does mostly now. Yeah, and so um, last year we did um, a couple of special Sunday night meals at Metro Fresh, and I do hope to do uh, more of them. Um, but one of them I decided, did, does anybody remember Asties in New York? So mom and dad loved Asties. When, and, and whenever we went to New York, we'd go there for dinner or after dinner for um, a, a stinger which is the height of fanciness. Um, and they had, they had um, opera singers who were waiters. And uh, of course, I thought that was amazing. So we recreated sort of Asties at Metrofresh. So I, I got red check tablecloths, I got Chianti bottles with wine, uh, with uh, candles. We did this amazing Northern Italian dinner that I, I created. And I hired four opera students from Georgia State. And they did this you know, they, they entertained, they, they went around and sang to people. And of course, I studied for many, many years, so I sang, I, I sang an opera piece, which was crazy, because I hadn't sung in a long time. Oh, what the fun. Mitchell, when you... When oh, and by the way, I'm sorry, if you go to my website, um, you can actually click over to our YouTube channel, and you can see it. It's, it's kind of cute, it's fun. Mitchell, give me a reaction when you went to, back to Jamestown High School today, and the reception you got from the a cappella choir, which I imagine most everybody is familiar with it, especially as we get into the holidays at uh, the Vesper service. Uh, this was this was a, an awesome bonus to the trip. Scott set this up just this morning, and I and I happened after I had this great conversation with Jim Roselli, um, I went down to the high school and went into the um, the chorus room and talked to these kids who sat where I sat, who who. Sat who are singing the same songs that I sang, um, and it was it was awesome. The thing that I was so impressed with is that when something is so ingrained, when a tradition is so ingrained, it it changes incrementally, but it almost doesn't change at all. So these kids, eighty five of them, I was I was shocked to see that room full. Actually, it, it, it kind of, I, I guess in my mind, I thought maybe it had dwindled in size. I mean, I think that at times it was 100 or 110 when Mr. Bouvet was there, maybe. But I was so impressed with these kids. So I talked, you know, as you can see, I, it's easy for me to talk. I did about a half an hour, and then they asked really great questions. And um, then they sang the Kyrie, you know, ye who have a fears, trouble, grief, or pain. And I sang with them, and I, I was handed the, the music, and I only had to look at it for like one second. And I, <laughs> but to, to stand there and be with them and, and let them know, and I was telling um, Grace about this earlier, to let them know that this education that they're getting in that room will make a difference their entire lives. It's very exciting for me to see that. And, it, you know, I know that Jamestown has had its ups and downs, and Jamestown, you know, is always going through transition, and it's always dire constant. You know, everything's going to fall apart. But to see that happen, and to see that, you know, and when they sang, they've obviously been taught to sing with their hands. Nobody had their hands in their pockets. Nobody was bad posture. They were standing and singing, and it was beautiful, and I get to stand and sing with them, and that was a really perfect way to spend part of my day. And I'll remember that for, for uh, forever. I, I stepped out of the frame. Yeah, well, I was gonna <laughs> um, I think that um, when I do, I, I love the all the soups in the, in the, in the book, but um, there are a lot of the, the salads that are super creative, have a lot of flavor profile, 
What I like to do, and I wouldn't say that there's any one thing that is my favorite, but what I like to do is really just, as I said before, improv with what we have prepped and, and how I want to build these flavors and you know have a little bit of fennel in there and a little bit of maple and a little bit of citrus and a little bit of curry, maybe a little bit of cumin, you know. And these all of these things and soups and salads are so possible. So I think that that's what I love to do. Just in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can tell Mr. Hall that. <laughs> George? I have a question. I think you left two recipes on. I'm sure it was an oversight. I'm sure it was. <laughs> you called Virginia up one time and said, I would like your brownie recipe. Uh, yes. And she said, it's, and you know, it's probably out of the Crush Cookbook. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm, I decided, I was going to have a couple pages of desserts in there, but I didn't really have enough. But I definitely would have put that in. I would have put a couple recipes of uh, both of my grandmothers in there. But I'm not, a, I'm not a huge dessert maker. I also so. forgot the sausage around the world. Sausage around the world. We had uh, many years at Cape Mayville. Now they're doing it for sportsmen. Oh, awesome. Would you think of expansion like a metro north in Bangkok? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love my concept. I think it's like... A, a, it's very flattering when people come in from all parts of the country, really. And we have a lot of um, production. There's a lot of film and television happening in, in Atlanta right now. Um, and I, w I had a second location at the Atlanta Botanical Garden for three years. I had a contract. And it was a little bit disappointing because that burned me out. Um, and and I, I believe that the concept will work anywhere, but it takes a certain kind of chef to be willing to every day go in there and have new ideas. Um, frankly, um, I'm really happy doing what I'm doing. Um, I, people ask me this all the time. Are you going to open in Dunwoody? Are you going to open in Alpharetta? Are you going to open in Charlotte? Are you going to open in Nashville? And, and yeah, I could. I, I'm sure I could find the money. I'm sure I could go do it. But I'm 54 years old. I'm ha I have a lovely life. I work hard. Um, I had time to write a book. I have time to come and talk to you know, go on these little trips now, and if I had one more restaurant, I'd have to have five more, because there'd no, be no reason, you won't make enough money on one, one more to make it mm -hmm. worthwhile. So I'd have to open five, and then, you know, I'd turn around and I'm 62 years old, and I've lost 10 years of my life. Um, yes, I can do the math, I know that's eight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I, I believe that I, I believe what I have is great, and I think maybe enough is enough. Theo? I have um, I kind of have a general idea of Camp Mayville, but have you discussed it already? Did I miss it when you described it? I, I have. We didn't well, really I describe want to hear a description. it. Description. Okay, so um, originally well, there were three families: the, the Griffins, the Cadwells, and the Andersons. My dad um, had purchased George. How many acres? Where? Where you go? George left. <laughs> oh, he was mad that I didn't put the brown in. Yeah. He so wanted to had, make a statement. How many he acres did Dad have? A hundred and uh, approximately a hundred and nineteen acres. Uh, just, just, um, uh, just by Mayville. Um, that sort of bordered land that bordered the gorge. Okay, so down Canada Road, um, and um, it was just empty acreage, you know, it, it, it was um, woods. And there was a little clearing, so every um, Labor Day weekend, Saturday, we'd go up there, and it was car camping. And mom, I see, uh, George was in charge of dinner, um, and Ginny um, Griffin was in charge of uh, nature. So she would, she would teach us all about the, the, the flora and the fauna. Um, <laughs> Uncle, um, my dad was in charge of kids' beverages. Uncle Sherry was in charge of adult beverages. Like, everybody had a job. Right? That's my boss. Yeah, your mom. Um, Aunt Carol was the nurse. Um, and so, originally, there were three families, and then the Rendells, when they moved to town, joined us. Um, and it was, uh, it was just magic, right? So, we were, I mean, there are great stories, but one, we were so young. That we, when we started, that um, there was a the uh, Anyasa used it as, as a part of the um, their summer 
they would go off on little camping trips. So they had erected um, a frame tent, and there were a couple cots there that were, you know, I'm sure tick filled. Um, but one year, apparently, while well, the parents are enjoying their adult beverages by the fire, um, young toddler Mitchell Anderson wound up underneath the, one of the cots, sleeping in the dirt. Nobody noticed, apparently, until the next morning. <laughs> I was fine. I was fine. So it was a place where we grew up, where, where our bonds as family, you know, the, the, the Cadwell girls and, and Scylla and Martha and the, the Rendell kids and all six of us, um, we just, that's why we are family, you know. Um, and it was my parents who made it happen, you know, and it was their energy that brought everybody together. So then as we get older, I'm not saying this happened, but it could have been where maybe you tried your first beer and you, you, maybe a, a beer went missing down to the lower campsite. You know, the, Don and Doug Rendell were there, you know. Oh, I really should. And, yeah, they're not here to defend themselves, but... But so many great memories, and um, we never, we always tried to, um, to seduce mom and dad and everybody else to staying two nights. We would hike down the gorge the next day, and when we come back, we'd be like, let's stay one more night. And they were so tired and so hungover that they couldn't. <laughs> it's true. I'll be glad to see this. <laughs> It's on film. It's not, they, they know the story. Yeah, so <laughs> well, let's, let's, I gotta draw closure here, because uh, my wife doesn't know how I'm gonna possibly pull this one off, where I'm gonna note that Mitchell is the most important Episcopalian here tonight. And I, I had a chance to interview his dad about the second most important Episcopalian, and that's Robert Jackson. So I'm going to give you this because oh, awesome. my wife couldn't figure out how you're going to work Jackson into this Mitchell Anderson <laughs> recipe. <laughs> 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 yes. Anyway, let me let me let me read close by this. This is the conclusion uh, of of the first part of the book. In the end, the journey is the destination. I wonder who originally said that. I believe it is to be true. My life's journey has been incredible. I'm beyond grateful I have been able to share the journey with a devoted partner, a loving family, and in the last 10 years, a new family of metro freshwells, actual and virtual. The pages that follow will not stop the earth from rotating. They won't silence the guns or heal the sick. They don't contain the profound thoughts of Maya Angelou, the humor of David Sedarius, or the philosophy of a Deepak Chopra. These pages are just me and the story of somewhat codependent, hardworking, sleep-deprived <laughs> chef-owner of a little restaurant in Midtown Atlanta with a big mouth. Enjoy. And we did. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you.